our lives. The nurses are offline. Now it's live. We're uh, live. Pretty, so, yep. Yeah. Good morning, folks. Good morning from Australia. This morning, unfortunately, Tova is unable to connect. Hopefully, during the morning, she uh, she will find a way to get in. Uh, but in the meantime, we've got Sippy Moss. Now, Sippy is a coach, and she's also a um, EMDR therapist. Am I right? You are, as well. As yes. Me. Yeah. Yeah, she has a wonderful story about walking the trail in Israel. It's an amazing, I think it's about a thousand kilometer trail. And she and her husband and children walk that trail to raise funds for AD, AD, ALS, sorry. I'm getting a bit disorganized, sorry. ALS, which is a, a, a form of um, MS or a motor neurone disease type illness, which um, her mother-in-law had and they raised a large amount of money and that was able to be put into research but please let me hand over to Zippy because she's got the real story I'm just repeating what I know so welcome and uh, please a first of all tell us a little bit about yourself what motivated you to do to do this and the results of it and then I've got lots of lovely questions about the stars and about being present on the earth and being present to the universe. So please go ahead. My pleasure. So first of all, for those of you who may be joining in other parts of the world, just wanted to let you know that it is 10 p.m. here in Jerusalem. So speaking of stars, Rose, there are stars in the heavens above me right now. And it's a pleasure to be here. Hopefully Tova will join us as well from Israel, but in the meantime, it, to all of you that are out there, I want to thank you for joining us, no matter what time of day it is, either morning, afternoon, or evening. And I'm excited to share a bit of the story. So first of all, um, you had mentioned uh, ALS. ALS is Lou Gehrig's disease. It is different than MS, but it's interesting, Rose, that you mentioned MS, because uh, the story of why uh, my husband and my son, you mentioned children, I do have a daughter as well. She did not join us on that 1,000 kilometer journey. Because I thought she did. No, she was very, very pregnant at the time that we started. And, oh, okay. and so it was impossible for her to join us. But our son, who was a 12th grader, and my husband and myself set out to do this uh, 1,000 kilometer trail that begins in the northern part of Israel uh, at a place called Tel da uh, Kibbutz Dan or Tel Dan is one of the archaeological sites there and it weaves its way through the country um, a real zigzag until you get to the southern border with Egypt in Eilat. Now actually you can do the trail in either direction. I just want to give people a little bit of a sense of the geography here. So this thousand kilometer trail, which is known as being one of the top 20 long distance trails in the country, according to National Geographic, you would do it. You would start it depending on what season, either north or south. In the north, you would begin in the fall because you wanna move away from the rains. And if you're starting it in the spring, you wanna move away from that incredible heat that you've got uh, coming off of the desert. Over half of Israel is desert, so you want to move away from that incredibly hot weather. And you asked, why did we do it? So as I mentioned, my mother-in-law died of ALS. And my um, sister-in-law had MS, and she eventually died of MS after we finished the trail. But my mother-in-law died not long before this decision was made. And my husband is an Israeli tour guide and makes his living from his legs, literally. He literally takes people walking through the land, also on buses, of course, but walking through the land. And his sister, who had MS, she used to be somebody um, who was very, very active physically. She used to teach water aerobics and other forms of exercise. So she was very physical, and we know what it's like for people to face a chronic illness, especially difficult ones like MS or ALS. We also know what it means for people to deal with chronic pain. Um, my my father-in-law was in a horrific uh, car accident years before, and he suffered from chronic pain. My dear mother had osteoarthritis, and so um, she too had chronic pain. 
On the other hand, one of the gifts when you witness people dealing with these kinds of things is it really teaches you to, to appreciate one's own body. So uh, my husband said, maybe there's a message in this for me. If three out of my family, the members of my family are facing such difficult things and they can barely walk, maybe there's a message that I'm supposed to walk. He always wanted to do the Israel Trail. That was a dream of his. But he felt like maybe it needed to be combined with something larger, like charity. And what didn't mention, Beautiful. yeah, he has, a, he has one more sister who lives here in Israel, and she too makes her living from her physical body. She's a Pilates teacher. So there's this interesting story being woven on my husband's side of the family of people who dealt with real disability and chronic pain and illness, and the others in the family that made their living from their body and from walking and from exercise and things like that. <laughs> Wonderful. So, yes. Yeah, so just so you when I, when did you start off? In the spring? We started in the fall, which meant that we the lived, fall, sorry. We started in the fall, um, on the on a holiday, a very uh, well known holiday here known as Sukkot, where people actually celebrate by being in these little booths outside. It's part of the Jewish tradition. it's one of the Oh yes, yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah. Tabernacles, yeah. as Christians may know yeah. it. Or, yeah, all these little booths outside to be closer to nature. Well, we didn't do that this year because instead we were walking the trail. That particular year, back in 2009, we were walking the trail. And as I said, combining it with charity, at that 1,000 kilometer trail, we decided to ask people to sponsor the kilometers by adopting kilometers and to purchase kilometers. And so each kilometer we asked people to give $36. So our hope was to raise 36,000. And in the end, we were very fortunate, we raised $40,000 for ALS research, which was very, very gratifying. Yeah. Fantastic. Now we haven't got a feed on the right hand side. I need to message Tova and find out why. Please, anyone with questions, please put them there. I don't know why we can't get Tova to online, but she's the custodian of the questions, unfortunately. Now, okay. in the meantime, please tell us a little bit about that feeling of being out there with nature when your body just, it relaxes down, no matter how much pressure you're putting on it, it somehow relaxes down. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, first of all, I, I want to back up a moment and Rose and say that um, I started this experience with a lot of doubts about my <laughs> capacity to finish the trip. So you, you're kind of going <laughs> into all this stuff. I think it's pretty important for us to say that there, there were some real bona fide challenges. Um, for example, uh, I, ever since I've been Oh, probably a teenager. I've I've suffered from knee problems, knee pain. Uh, probably was was due to hyperflexibility in my knees. So actually, I was quite concerned about carrying a backpack. If that wasn't clear to everybody, we backpack the trail. And <laughs> I am. You can't see this, folks, but I am not even five feet tall in meters. I am probably about a meter and 47, 1.47. So, and I weighed just a little over 50 kilos. You know, for those of you that know pounds, it's a little over 110 pounds. So it was not simple to think about carrying all of that weight on my back and especially with knee issues. So I got myself checked out, went to a physiotherapist before I started the trail. He said, what you need to do is strengthen yourself as much as possible. I hit the gym. I did a lot of walking, walked around with, uh, you know, weights in my in my backpack before setting out on the trail. So I began with a lot of trepidation, especially when in the very beginning, we met other hikers who said, if you're exhausted now, just wait, just wait until you get to the desert, which is known as the really, really tough part. But I do have to say that those challenges at the same time that were really um, significant ended up being a godsend in certain ways because you learn so much you learn so much about yourself and your own capacity through the challenges yeah. of a long distance trek like that. And there is something invaluable that comes from 
using your body in a hard, hard way. I think that we've become such a sedentary society today. And so much of our pain comes from not using our bodies as they were meant to be used. You know, I think our bodies crave being used physically. And here, most of us are spending too much of our time, like right now in front of the computer. Yes, right? sitting, talking. Yeah. Uh, did you feel like giving up as you were going? Did I feel like, know, say again? Giving up, yeah. Because oh, you'd be going through towns and things like that. We well, could easily get a taxi home. Yeah, I would say that for each one of us, we we definitely had our breaking points. Uh, what I what I want to say is that the odds were a little bit against our making it to the very end of the trail because the research and the stats say that out of every ten people that plan to do the trail in one go, about three out of ten make it, and we were three, right? So the chances of all of us <laughs> making it wasn't great but the good news is i'm going to jump you ahead now you know to the to the end of the trail we did make it we did make our charity goal and i think a huge part of the reason why that happened was um is it i'm also a life coach not just a uh, not just a psychotherapist and in my coaching practice i say to people over and over again if you have an important goal and what do i mean by important goal if you have a vision which is you know what it is you want to do and you know why you want to do it. And the why is a burning desire in you. And that why not only serves you, but serves something beyond yourself. And in our case, we knew that we were walking it for people who couldn't walk, people who didn't have the capacity to walk. Oh, so you had a huge motivation. Huge motivation. A massive motivation. Yes. And so yeah. I will say that every single morning, when we got up in the morning, the first thing we do, did was we took our hiking poles and we took our hands put our hands on, on one on top of the other, and we started the morning with a prayer that our footsteps would be safe, that we would make it to the end of the day, reminding ourselves who we were walking for. And when we had those moments of intense weariness or pain or exhaustion, we told ourselves, we can take another step. It's a choice, right? Yeah, just one more, one more for the day, one more for the afternoon. Yeah. And, and the people we were walking for, for them, it's not a choice, right? They couldn't do it. They would love, I'm sure, to have been in our situation, which would have been to feel the pain, to be able to walk, to have blisters, to have pressure sores, to have pain in the back. They would have been joyful that if those had been their problems. So it really put things in perspective for us. Of course. And, yeah. and, and also the fundraising that you did. Because you not only did you have have the people who couldn't walk, but you were also the people that were supporting you, that were your backup. So yeah. that, of course, creates more motivation, doesn't it? Not letting other people down. Oh, absolutely. That was absolutely mm. true. And there's yeah. something to be said too. The other motivation is once you start a journey like this, I mean, I'm not talking to everybody. I, I, I Like you, I'm not seeing questions in the chat. So I hope folks that I'm able to to anticipate the questions that you might be wondering and answer those. But when you take a journey, think about those of you out there in the audience, no matter whether your journey is something more akin to Thoreau who basically journeyed in his backyard or Abraham our, or our forefather Abraham, who you could say was the first Israel trail hiker. He hiked probably 5,000, walked 5,000 kilometers through the Middle East. Any good journey, even if you stay in your home and you explore within, it changes you and it changes the world within you and the world outside of you. There's no doubt. Beautiful. About yeah. And, yeah. We call it character change. Oh, absolutely. I think I learned yeah. so much, so much about myself, so much about my family. Um, one of the questions yeah. I often say is, so what was it like to hike together as a family? I have to say that was, I mentioned worrying about the physical challenges, but between you and me, Rose, I was really concerned about what was it going to do to our family dynamic. I mean, just imagine there we had our 12th grade grader son, 18 years old, right, who would be seeing his parents in not pretty situations. Oh and and it like this puts a lot of pressure on you, tremendous amount of pressure on you. And, um, we didn't always behave well. That's the honest truth. I mean, I, I wrote a book. I'm going to show people. I wrote a book about this called Angels and Tahina. 
18 lessons from, oops, sorry, 18 lessons from hiking the Israel Trail. Yeah. And some of the lessons. Some of the lessons. Of the lessons I mean, on, yes, thank you. Uh, we now feed. If she's, oh, here we are. She's yeah. already done it. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Tova. Thanks, Tova. That's wonderful. So I do share in there 18 lessons that I learned along the trail. And one of them was uh, both the challenges, but also the gifts of doing it with your loved ones. And um, when we initially started, yes. people said, so where did you sleep? So about half of the time we were sleeping outside in a tent. And initially the plan was my husband and I were going to be in the tent. And my son said he was going to sleep under the stars in his sleeping bag. But he very quickly discovered that was not a good solution. The weather was um, not pleasant parts of the time, either extremely hot. So you don't want to be under, you know, under the sun, bugs, you know, wild animals. You know, there are hyenas, there are jackals in Israel, there are wild boar in Israel. So he decided quite early on that he was better off being in this tent that was really more comfortable for two people. It ended up being a tent for the three of us. So just imagine <laughs> me, a woman with two men who've been hiking the trail all day. Your feet are inside these boots. You take off the boots, the smelly socks, the smells, the intimacy, the challenges. But there were tremendous gifts because my eyes were also opened up to my family, my husband and my son, and their strengths. And this bonded us in a way that never would have happened had we not had that experience. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Was he impatient with his parents? I was, have to like, say. Was he, was he that fitter? He was the opposite of that. I oh, okay. swear. I could have not, I'm going to joke now, but I could have nominated him for sainthood, how he put up with us and how patient he was. And honestly, he said it was one of the greatest experiences of his life. It really was. And for me to see how much we could rely on him and how our son really became our peer on this trip was something incredible. Beautiful. Said, a trip changes you. At any, any trip, if you keep yourself open, changes you, changes your perceptions and changes the relationships you have with your traveling companions. Hopefully for better, not always. In our case, it was for the better. Yeah. And fantastic. Yeah. I, I'm wondering, as you, as you settled for the night and you settled and your feet ached, I'd imagine that sleep would have come incredibly quickly and oh, rest. That's a really great question um, because, again, the body did demand what the body needed, which was to yeah. heal from the hiking during the day. And yeah, so that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. So we would go to bed. One of the things that was so beautiful, I think that I've just I discovered on the trail how out of sync so many of us are with the natural rhythms of the world. So, for yes. example. You know, most of us are used to going to bed quite late, long after the sun sets, but all of that changed on the trail. We would go to sleep not long after it, it became dark, you know, like maybe an hour or two after it was dark. Once I remember somebody called us on the trail at 7.30 at night, 8 at night, and we thought, who's calling us? Who's trying to wake us up at this hour? Like, don't we need our sleep? We would, up, we would get up very early in the morning because when you're hiking in the winter, it gets dark very, very quickly. The other thing that I, I learned um, beyond the power of sleeping within like the natural rhythm of the, you know, the light dark cycle of a day was there was something not always comfortable, right? Not always comfortable at sleeping directly on the ground, but eventually, and this might shock people, eventually I did not want to go back home and sleep in my own bed because there's something profound about sleeping on the earth something incredibly comforting and connecting and ground, literally grounding about that. So I would go to bed often exhausted, weary, aching. And in the morning, I woke up feeling so much better. It was as if something in sleeping on the ground healed me. I truly felt that. Wow. I don't know if others out there have had the same experience. 
but there there is something about you know we have our own individual bodies and then there's the body of the earth of mother earth we call the earth yeah. mother right and yeah. all of that i felt like sometimes i was being rocked i read about that yeah being rocked in the arms of mother earth and i know that sounds sort of corny and i probably wouldn't have believed it had i not slept you know about half of the time outside on this two month journey. But it was truly, that was truly a game changer too, was recognizing the power of sleeping outside on the ground and connecting in that kind of way. Tell, tell me also about eating. Uh, tell me a little yeah. bit about that because you've just actually brought, you know, I, when I originally spoke to you, I thought about the magnificence of the earth when you're away from the from light, you know, um, light on earth, and we've got the beautiful canopy over us of the stars. Now you've actually connected that with the with the groundedness of the earth, and I thought now let's have a look at the how we fuel our bodies with energy, and what did you do, and how did you cope with? I don't know. I presume you build a campfire or something what did you do to to okay. cook food? Yeah. that is such a profound question because just as i said that we modern human beings have become unfortunately disconnected from um the diurnal cycles right of light and dark waking and sleeping we've become also very disconnected from um our hunger rhythms and what it really means to eat when we're hungry. Most of us eat because it's time to eat or because we're bored or we're angry or we're upset. And I'll never forget something. My daughter, the one who was pregnant at the time and working who couldn't join us, she also loves hiking. And I remember years before we did the trail, we went on a hiking trip together and she saw what I was putting in my backpack in terms of food and she was absolutely shocked. And I said, what's the problem? We're going to need this. And she looked at me. She goes, you don't understand. Once you're hiking all day long, your appetite is going to be different. I said, yeah, I know. I'm going to be very hungry after walking all day. She goes, no, that is not how it works. You're going to be, you're, you're going to see your body is going to shift and you're going to be less hungry. So this was a trip that we took, about a three-day hiking trip. And we ended up ditching a huge amount of the food. She was absolutely right that our hunger cycles totally change. And there's something about using your body. Like I said, the body is almost aching to be used and the more you use it, it seems like the more, the more it regulates your appetite. It's a like counterintuitive, I think, to most people, but that's what we experienced. So for me, typically, I'd get up in the morning very early. I'd, I could not even think about eating until after I had walked for about an hour and a half to two hours. I was not hungry when I first got up. Our meals were very, very light meals, just to give people an idea. You know, breakfast, you have to carry everything on your back, right? And we're talking, as I mentioned, Israel, which um, unlike a lot of the other long distance trails, does not have a lot of water spots or water supplies. So we're yeah, well, that was, my, that was my initial thought when you told me you're walking through yeah. the desert, because I yeah. know when I went down, down into that mm -hmm. desert part of Israel, there's nothing, only mountains and sand and some date palms. So. Yeah, so imagine you've got to carry uh, water often, you know, to take you throughout most of the day, sometimes even longer than that. So we were carrying at least four liters of water to six liters of water a day, which is the equivalent of four to six kilo just in water alone, which meant that you've got to think very hard about the food you're taking, very hard about it, about when it comes to that. So uh, the food had to be dense, calorie rich and as light as possible. So it was things in the morning like nuts, dried fruits. Um, why is the book called Angels and Tahina? The Tahina part is Tahina, or as many many people in other parts of the world call it Tahini, sesame paste, is very, very protein rich. And uh, we traveled and ate Tahina every single day, sometimes hummus, not too many fresh vegetables, except when we would run into angels, the other part, the title of the book, Angels and Tahina. Sometimes we just ran into good souls. Uh, a couple of times people who were farming their own little little plots of land and who saw us and very kindly just gifted us with fruits, with vegetables that happened along the way. 
So meals were simple. And at night, you know, we would cook and it would be a pot of lentils and rice or quinoa or something very, very simple like that. And the truth is, that was enough. It was enough. Yeah. Um, but how did you afford, did you bring a gas cooker with you or what did you do? Yes, we had a small gas cooker with us. Um, okay. We, every night, I mentioned every night we would make meals uh, out if we were camping out. Uh, about half of the time we weren't camping out because one of the other beautiful experiences of the Israel Trail, and I must say, uh, I know you talk a lot about healing with your community. So one of the things that was very healing for me was not just the land itself, but the remarkable people that we met along the way who wow. challenged me and made, motivated me to want to be a better person because uh, the Israel Trail not only is unique in terms of its topography, my husband often jokes that, you know, you've got everything from waterfalls and streams in the north to stark deserts in the south. Uh, you know, you've got everything from, as I said, wild boar in the north to camels and hyenas. <laughs> it's a real mix. So um, in this experience of hiking, you really rely on the goodness of, of other souls. And Israel's yeah. a remarkable network of somewhere between four to 500 trail angels. And trail angels are just good people who open up their homes and their hearts to people that are walking the Israel Trail, offering wow. them anything from pinch, pitching a tent in their backyard to the whole shebang, you know, welcoming you into their home, giving you fresh sheets and blankets and a nice comfortable bed and hot. And a shower. And a shower. And hot meals and <laughs> remarkable, remarkable people who truly inspired me to want to give more of myself in that kind of way. Talk a little bit about how your body adjusted. You know, you said about your food adjusting, uh, you need to sleep adjusted, but also tell me about the refreshing, I don't know what it is, um, I, I use the word joy, but it's not joy, it's sort of like, some resilience and i'm trying to connect that to you know your knee joint pain and i presume if you've got knee joint problems you also had probably hip problems and how you overcame that and how that didn't i presume it ended up not being a problem i'm guessing but tell me you're more guess, you're guessing right so um yeah. as i mentioned hiking about anywhere from between i say 18 to 25 kilometers a day and and going up you know up and down some sometimes some very steep inclines and declines Dip and rough and rough surfaces as well very rough surfaces and very much rough surfaces yeah. so in the beginning it, it was hard it was exhausting um i would end the day sometimes feeling like my feet had been pounded into hamburger that they really really felt that my everything hurt, not just my knees, my whole body hurt. But over time, you know, over time, I can't tell you exactly when it started. But I remember, you know, in the beginning, we adjusted by stretching a lot, by taking off our shoes, airing out, you know, taking off socks, airing out our feet, uh, m making a point of stopping every, I don't know, hour and a half or every few hours or so to take a break. At some point, things shifted. And again, it was as if the more we worked our bodies, the more our bodies began to work for us. And at some point, there was no more, there was really no more knee pain. My knee pain just disappeared. Ooh. Part of that, I would say part of that had to do, maybe the biggest part of it had to do with, again, working the body so hard. I mean, a lot of times, I'll never forget something the physiotherapist said to me when I first went to him about my concerns with my knees he said listen pain pain is something that you have to learn to work with and i say this to the people that are out there in in your audience listening he said you know there are people who have real physical issues and they don't experience pain and there are other people without physical issues that do experience pain so there's a strong emotional and psychological component to it so he said so just explore your body's um boundaries. It says, if you're feeling pain for more than 24 hours, then pull back. 
you know, as you're getting, as you're getting your body uh, into shape, this is when I was going out to the gym to work out. And he says, and when you're on the trail also, like be kind to your body. Yes, allow it to rest, but allow yourself to push beyond the pain. Because he said a lot of times what happens, and this is very true, is that we guard ourselves against pain rather than allowing ourselves to explore. explore. We hook that up with fear, don't we? Yes, exactly. Because we know we've injured yeah. ourselves. And I've certainly, I've injured myself in the past, like so many other people I'm sure that are listening in, I've sprained my ankles. Like I said, I'm hyper, I have hyper flexible knees. So I know, I know what that's like. And what, what can end up happening is then we're afraid, are we going to injure ourselves worse? And exactly. we, the brain has recorded like memories, like little brain impressions that say, well, we don't like that particular movement because in the past that that's what caused you pain. So what happens is you get more and more rigid and more and more confined in terms of what you allow yourselves to explore. So here's what happened. I allowed myself to explore the length and breadth of the country of Israel, you know, the place that I had been living since 1979. I started hiking at the Israel Trail in 2009, so that was quite a bit later. But not only was I exploring my country, I was exploring my body in ways that I never had before, right? I was exploring Mother Earth and my own mother's body in a way that I had never had an opportunity to do before and play with those boundaries, and which was fascinating. Do you think also that the challenges prevented you from thinking about your pain? That well, if you think you, about yeah, us, more. us with chronic pain and you think when you're protecting yourself and protecting yourself, like you've got a bad back or bad leg, you know, you've got sciatica and you're protecting yourself from that but you, when you're doing that hike you've actually got to move whether or not it hurts or not so you've got to overcome the fear of the hurt and, and I'm thinking you know you talked about the hyenas well you know <laughs> if they were chasing you do they chase you no no we never actually saw a hyena we only heard one in the middle of the night um, we didn't know it was a you know, It sounded like something or somebody was breathing really loud outside the tent. And it was oh, only, how fascinating. It was oh. only the next morning when we woke up and we noticed that our garbage bag had been dragged away from the tent and ripped open and large paw prints, you know, in the sand. In the, uh, it was only in the ground. It was only then that we realized, okay, that was a hyena that we'd heard. And because they are, they are fairly common, not so common, but common enough in the desert. But, oh, what, okay. but what you're asking about uh, the challenges is interesting. Yes. What mm. I would say is, um, again, I'm not into extreme sports, but I've often heard people who are really into serious extreme sports that what attracts them to it is that it pulls them into the moment, right? And that there's no past, there's no future, there's just the present moment. Presence. There's yeah. just that present moment because you need to be focused on the present. So I would say that pain can do the same thing for us, right? And I, it can, of course- Explore that a bit more, explore that a bit more. Well, I'll tell you when, uh, years ago, I went on a Vipassana retreat and, and you would sit in meditation for 45 minutes at a time, right? Seven, for seven days, tell them. <laughs> uh, I didn't do it for seven, I just did it for a mere three and a half, but Okay. I, did, I did it in a kind of a foolish way at the time because I was younger and I wasn't as kind to my body. So it meant that once, and, I, and I'm able to sit in full lotus because I have very, very flexible knees. So I told myself once I got into position, I wasn't going to move no matter how much pain I was in. And that was not smart because to sit 45 minutes in full lotus, at some point I can tell you that the pain got so excruciating, it was far worse than childbirth. It was far worse than any pain I had experienced in my life, but I had promised myself I wasn't going to move. So something extraordinary happened. Uh, the pain got so bad that I, I noticed myself thinking, oh my God, how much more of this can I take? I've, I've been enduring this horrific pain for this long. So I would go into the past remembering the pain that I've been experiencing now, 20 minutes into my sit, and then I would be thinking about the future, how much more, how many more minutes are left in this? How pain am I going to endure? Until it got so bad, the pain got so awful that 
I said, okay, you can't think about how much pain you've already experienced and you can't think about how much pain is ahead of you. Just focus on the next breath, just your next breath. And I started to do that. It literally was taking one breath at a time, one breath at a time. At some point, it was not even one breath at a time. It was one inhale, one exhale, one inhale, one exhale. And the extraordinary, miraculous thing that happened, and if this had, if I had not experienced this myself, I would not have believed it was possible. Like this, at some point, the pain disappeared. It was gone, and it did not come back. And I remember... Okay, so, so through the breathing, can we talk about that for a few moments? So through the breathing, you were able to dispel the pain when you did that Vipassana retreat. Is that, is that what you're saying? Just the breathing. It was the breathing grounded me in the present. And at some point being grounded in the present, it truly was as if the past and the future disappeared. They weren't there didn't anymore. Exist. They did yeah. not exist. So there was something. That's the gift, I think, of, of our breath, right? Um, that yeah. it gives us the possibility of being fully present, although often we take it for granted. and. I mean, that's one of the things that probably a lot of people now during this pandemic, so many people experienced breathing problems. So suddenly they became extremely focused on their breath because it became so difficult to breathe. But I believe that in every challenge, there is a potential gift. Like my knee pain brought me also into more awareness of how amazing my joints are. Like we tend to take for granted the things that are working okay. We usually of don't. Of course. Yeah. We don't focus on those things. We don't say thank you for those things, right? But it really That's is quite remarkable. And with your permission, Rose, can I just share something from one of the chapters of the book, which is do, about honoring the body since we've been talking do about Do please, it. do please. So uh, I just, I'm going to just share two short paragraphs from the chapter, which is called Honor Thy Body. So the first, this is from the beginning. Our trek on the Israel Trail taught me that my body could be more powerful and capable than I imagined. It loved being pushed. In fact, the more I used it, the more it resembled a Maserati. Powerful, fast, and very cool. After almost a thousand kilometers of walking up and down all kinds of terrain, carrying almost a quarter of my body weight, previous knee pain totally disappeared. So that was remarkable. It really taught me to honor my body. But I also want to talk about, as I said before, there's this connection between earth body and human body. So in Hebrew, the word for foot is regel, and it's the same root word for the three major biblical festivals of Sukkot, Passover, and Shavuot. When people from the entire country used to walk up to Jerusalem, Israel's spiritual center, and ascend to the Holy Temple. Rav Cook a famous 20th century rabbi said that even in our era, each step one takes in the land of Israel is a mitzvah, a, a divine commandment. To me, now this is for you, Rose, as you're an Australian, yes. right? To me, this seems parallel to the Australian Aborigine walkabout, an adolescent rite of passage that traces the song lines of their ancestors. These sacred paths must be walked in order to keep the world alive. In Hebrew, mitzvah, which means commandment, actually comes from the word mitzvah, to join together. Walking taught me to better respect and connect to two bodies, my own puny yet miraculous one, as well as planet Earth's. What if this land really is a sacred scroll that each one of us etches with the soles of our miraculous feet? So that was for sure a lesson that walking, hiking, backpacking gave me was this immense appreciation for myself as a physical human being and for planet Earth as this beautiful physical entity that honestly, I wish we were taking better care of. Just like we need to take better care of our own human bodies, we need to take care of planet Earth. And of the bigger, bigger well. story. Yes. Yeah. 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 My husband took our children through to the Simpson Desert when they were younger. And Where is that, Rose? Oh, it's in the centre of Australia. It's a desert. It's sand, like the Sahara, that sort of desert. And uh, 
and my children have never forgotten it. And that's uh, 30 years ago. They've never forgotten it. So going into that into that area of of nothingness and yet everythingness, you know, like you know, you've just got sand and dunes and scrub and and that sort of thing, and 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 well, we'd have dingoes, you know, wild dogs, but right. yeah, um, it's profound. And they still talk about being under the stars at night, and I think that's why I asked you about that in the first place, because I think that's that's that touching the earth and seeing the stars above us and the stars in the outback are so close to us. It's just, it's beautiful. It's profound. And, uh, and you're talking about, about that walking up to, uh, to Jerusalem, which is on the top of a mountain. And uh, to get there, you've got to go up a hill, whichever way you go from it, around it or whatever, it's up a hill. So uh, yes. you're reaching... You're reaching to the stars, to the universe, really, aren't you? When you, when you, when you look at it like that, yeah, yeah. And there is, there is a sense on the one hand of feeling very, very small, and at the same time, a sense of minute, being, really, minute, very, nothing. In when you look at the stars, we're we're just tiny. we're smaller than ants, aren't we? Yes. That's look, the reason the reason that we thought that that your story is so profound and so special is that when our audience and when our group of people think about their own journey, and even if it's only a small journey, I remember one person telling me he got from the house to the letterbox and back, and that's how he started his movement. It was painful, but he did it and he did it and he did it, and he got to the letterbox, and then he was able to go more, and then he was able to go down the street a bit and gradually... He, he brought his fear under control, brought his sort of sense of himself and his strength under control, and then his legs operated. It was just a, such a lovely story, and the way he described his recovery was just beautiful. So for, for all of us here that are watching, and we can't tell how many, and we've got no questions, uh, but actually, in actual fact, You've actually answered all our questions, if you think about it, haven't you? Have I? I, I no, I don't think probably by a long. Oh, time. I think you have. We've covered. We've covered health. We've covered wellness. We've covered sleep. We've covered food. We've covered being under the stars. We've covered family relationships. What you know, else was? Covered and the spiritual journey you just brought in just now. You know what we have not covered though at all, um, at all, Rose. And I think for people in the audience, this may be important and significant. Uh, people that are dealing with, look, I am also trained as a medical coach, and people that are dealing with physical issues, whether it's a disability or whether it's chronic pain. And by the way, they're not alone in this. I think there's an enormous fear of death. Okay. Oh, perfect. Yes. And yes. I'm assuming that that is, look, I, I bring it up because clearly having had uh, two people in our family, in my, in my, uh, as my in-laws, who were dealing with terrible illnesses, MS and ALS, certainly with my mother-in-law with her ALS, that is, that's a terminal illness. And so uh, to witness what it was like for her to have her body bit by bit fade away where while her mind was still intact made me think a lot about these issues of mortality and I think not just people facing chronic illness or acute illness but human beings in general are afraid of dying they're very afraid of death and um, years ago maybe it's partly because I live in a part of the world where oh, what can I tell you we're under attack I mean we've gone through two intifadas so the second intifada, buses were blowing up, you know, almost every single day. My son and daughter were in school at the time and, you know, we're going to school. We're not taking buses to school, but certainly taking buses into town. We're surrounded here in Israel by the story of, um, of death, mortality, fragility of life. And so on some level, uh, it was important for me to confront that. And so... I myself also had an experience where I did something very, very foolish once, and I ran across the street against a red light without looking in both directions. 
and got myself grazed by a car. And I realized, again, how fragile life is, and none of us really know how long we have here. And so I ended up developing uh, a course called Dying to Live, because I figured, oh, of course, yeah. I just figured yeah. it's not unfortunate that um, most of us wait until death is staring us right in the eyes before we make the changes we need to make, whether it's um, cleaning up relationships with loved ones or living in more authenticity and integrity with ourselves, uh, letting go of what we no longer need, whether it's stuff, you know, physical stuff or emotional stuff or psychological stuff. And I just wanted for people to be able to go through a safer process when their brains and their bodies were still functioning better so, but that they could go through a similar process of facing the ultimate deadline so that they would wake up to their own lives. So I think again on the trail, what I would say is ugh, here in Israel, I, I didn't, I, I, um, we didn't talk about this much, but as you walk through the land of Israel, because this is a place that has known so much strife and so many battles, you end up passing, um, you know, monuments to people who've been killed in battles and, you know, historically, you know what's gone on in the country. So again, death stares you in the face on the trail and stares you in the face just in terms, again, of the cycles of nature. You you can be in the desert and see, you know, that there's all of the, all of the foliage almost is dried up. The flowers live for a very, very short time in the desert. And when they do bloom, it's an astounding sight to see. And when there's a flood in the desert, it's an amazing thing to see. And at the same time, you get caught in a flash flood, you can die. And that happened not long to a group of young people who were hiking in a canyon. Uh, That's right, yeah. Was there yeah. a horrific we, example of, yeah. of kids that were just had just finished high school, I, I believe, or they were still in high school, and they got caught in a narrow canyon during a flash flood and they died. So I, what I'm asking everybody in this audience to think about is, let us all wake up to our lives, appreciate that there is for all of us a deadline. None of us know when that deadline shows up. But what we do have control over is how we deal with the fear, how we deal with the challenges, how we deal with the pain, how we deal with the fact that we are born into a physical body and how we deal with being in a physical body. And can we learn to appreciate those bodies both for what is working as well as learning to work with what isn't working as well? Does, does that make sense, Rose, what I'm saying? Absolutely. Could I also this add to that? And I'm, I'm seeing here that Tova's Ah, oh, yeah. uh, yes, a couple of things. Okay. Okay, thank you, Tova, for sharing that. What take-home insights do you want to leave with the audience, and how do we deal with fear and pain? Oh, those are great questions, and they're big questions. So okay. um, for one... Can I, can I just go back before you answer that? to comment on the fact that accepting death is, a, is an important part of living. And to just add to what you've just said, that when you accept death and know that it's coming and know that it's going to come at some stage, then your present life becomes much, much more um, 3D, put it that way, stronger. And, you know, because I've worked in palliative care all my life, I know how it is that some people can accept death and can grow from it and can actually hand on something to others, whereas others fear it so badly that they can't get rest. And it's important to sort of see that that also goes on in our daily lives and that that fear and that un, that lack of rest is actually what you what you challenged, I suppose, by going on your trail. I know you you do that sort of thing, probably you know more often than than the rest of us would. But that's the fear and that's the challenge that you know um, you know if there was a lack of water and your your the water bottle broke. You know, you're there in the desert and you're, you know, an hour or two hours from the next um, uh, village or whatever. And, and I, I just thought it, 
you brought it into to, into sort of like into reality as you spoke about the fact that you're away in the desert and you're surviving on what you've got and and in a way i think that there's something about death and the end of our lives and the giving up of our human bodies to the earth is important to actually acknowledge and see and and i'm trying to sort of couple that with things like ms als um and uh, what motor neuron disease all of those things the person is fully aware awake and is actually seeing their bodies go down 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 and often their courage comes up 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 and you know it brings tears to the back of my eyes as i think of the people that i've nursed in this situation and how they've grown could you just if you can reflect on how your mother your mother-in-law coped with the fact that she began to be unable to speak and to share her love and care with others. Could, could you just draw that out a little bit before you um, talk about um, take-home insights, please? Uh, yeah, I still, yeah, there's a few things I still want to share. Well, it was, it was very, I know it was very difficult for her. Yeah. To, with losing parts of her physical body bit by bit. Um, she was a woman who had so much joy, so much zest for living. She really enjoyed um, the small things in life. You know, she loved to laugh. She loved to talk. She loved to, um, she loved to walk. She loved to be out, you know, outside in nature. She took care of plants. So to see those things fade away was very difficult for her and very, very difficult for us. And at the same time, I, I remember the last time she said, uh, and it was so hard to get these words out, right? This is before she started using a hand, you know, handheld machine to type, where it was important for her to be able to say, I love you. And yet it was so hard for her to vocalize those words. So difficult. But she was a huge teacher for me because, again, it was through her that I became aware of how easy it is to take the small and simple things for granted in life. And I think that this past year with the global pandemic, I think Corona has offered that. I'm not trying to minimize the real pain and tragedy that many, many people have experienced this last year with COVID. But any huge challenge in life does carry within it a potentially huge gift. And witnessing what happened with my mother-in-law again, emphasize to me the preciousness of these small everyday things. That and courage. That's the other absolutely, part, you see. Absolutely. It's the courage that I see in people as they, as they allow their bodies to, to be released or their souls to be released, however you want to take it. Yes. And uh, there is some, there's, again, a paragraph that I would love to share with you because you said, what did I learn what did I learn from these people with, with ALS? What did I learn from my mother-in-law? So what I would say, I don't know for sure that I would have gotten to the end of the trail without having that enormous motivation because this, yeah. this is what I wrote. But in our moments of exhaustion, I leaned most on the tenacity and fortitude of all of those struck by ALS. When we were filled with doubts and fears, I leaned on their courage in coping with a disease that had no cure. When we were homesick, I thought about how they were losing that most precious of homes, the human body, bit by bit. When I cursed, I thought about the fact that I had a voice to do that. When our water supplies were low, I was grateful that I had the ability to sip the little that I had left. When my legs almost buckled from exhaustion, I considered how lucky I was that I could walk at all. We prayed every morning, putting our hands and hiking poles together that our feet would be steady, our footsteps sure. And each day, we remembered those with ALS, many of whom could no longer walk or even stand, but were among the strongest, most upright people we knew. Like invisible hiking poles, they supported us and pushed us forward when our strength faltered and helped us reach the end of the trail. So <laughs> the end of the trail is also, you know, we can think about the end of the trail as metaphorically the end of one's life too. So, right? Um, it's it's fascinating for me to be talking about all of this during a year in which we're still dealing with a global pandemic. 
and yeah. as two of a rights here, how do you deal with fear and pain has become more relevant than ever, I think, for folks. So one way, one way I, I would say to deal with it is um, it's important to go beyond yourself, as I said, and going beyond yourself can take many forms. It can take the forms of exploring the boundaries of the pain. Um, it can uh, it can take the form of thinking of others and giving to others, going beyond yourself that way. Because as I said, if we hadn't had this burning motivation to make it to the end of the trail and raise that money, I don't know that all three of us would have made it to the very end. Um, it's so important. I believe it's so important to, as I said, the place of miracles happens when you do something that you care about, but that also is going to benefit somebody else. So that would be one of the other takeaways that one of the beautiful things I saw happening worldwide with COVID is that what lightened people's pain and fear was that they started caring about their neighbors, right? They started reaching out and volunteering and, and calling. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. The other message I want to put out to people is uh, the following, that Israel itself is a unique country in that, you know, in some ways it, it, it shouldn't be here, right? It's the country was kind of created out of the ashes of the Holocaust. One would say, you know, if you told people at the time of the Holocaust there's going to be a Jewish state, nobody would have believed that. They would have said that's impossible. So I want to talk just a moment, um, if we can. I don't know how much time we have left. But this intersection of what does it really, what things really are possible and how do we define what's impossible? And is it possible that the impossible doesn't really exist? And we challenge that in the moment, right? And the reason I bring this up is that so many people, you know, they go to the doctor and the doctor gives them a diagnosis. And then they think to themselves, well, I can't do X, Y, Z anymore. And the doctor has told me that this isn't going to be possible, that I, uh, this is possible, but this isn't possible. And I want to say to people, don't let anybody define that for you. It's important. Exactly. Yay. Don't let anybody define that for you because there are so many things that I have seen firsthand things that I witnessed on the trail and I'm going to share one of them with you, which is just awesome. There were there, when we finished the trail, we were put up, we were, we were put up so graciously by a kibbutz north of a lot called Kibbutz Keturah. And on Kibbutz Keturah, we were um, treated to a tour, to a tour of the kibbutz. And we saw lots of amazing things there. They were doing the technology in the desert is like beyond, beyond, beyond. It's just incredible. But it was there on Kibbutz Ketura that I met, um, I met a really incredible being. I met Methuselah. Now, who is Methuselah? I'm not talking about the Methuselah from the Bible, but I'm talking about uh, a date palm that was germinated from a 2,000-year-old date seed that was found not far from the Saba. Now, what's important for people to understand is Two women PhD, two women doctor, doctors, right? Doctoral, doctorate doctors, not medical doctors. They had this crazy dream. I'm not going to go into all the reasons as to why, although one of them felt like there are so many things out in nature that can heal us that haven't been explored. And she became exactly. curious when she herself was sick with, a, with an illness and she was helped by medicinals in India. She thought, well, why not try to explore why we, what we've got here in Israel as well? And she became curious about what might be the properties uh, inherent in, in ancient, ancient date, date palms. So she and these two women decided to try and do what botanists said was impossible, germinate a 2,000-year-old date seed. But guess what? They did. And at the time, when we were introduced to Methuselah, they said, well, there's good news and there's bad news. That Yes, we've succeeded in propagate, propagating this 2,000-year-old Judean date palm from a seed, but Methuselah is a male. So they had hoped that they would, you know, mate Methuselah with a modern-day date palm. At the time, I was thinking, oh, I hope they find a good wife for Methuselah. But what I couldn't have imagined at the time is they succeeded in germinating other six other date seeds. And two of those, two of those date seeds. Ufina. And wow. they brought one of the females, you know, they fertilized. The female was fertilized by Methuselah, the one named Hannah. 
And do you realize that this year, just this year, they harvested 111 dates from the marriage between Methuselah and Hannah. Okay, that to me is such a beautiful story about not believing what other people tell you and letting yourself be motivated by your own crazy dreams and explore the boundaries of what we think. I mean, you were talking about something that nobody believed was physically possible, but it happened. And literally, wow. we see the fruits of this, the fruits of that experiment. So that would be the other thing I would wish to tell people is go ahead and dare to explore things that others have told you are not possible. And don't yeah. believe everything that you're told that is impossible because guess what? If we had listened to many of people in the world today had listened to things that we'd been told were impossible, we wouldn't be flying airplanes today, would we? That's right. Or have the radio or television. Exactly. The internet. Yeah. All of these incredible things and, and, and beautiful cures that have come from people who said there's got to be a better way. Yeah. Oh, you know, it, uh, we we met the, we met along the trail somewhere about halfway through the country. This beautiful, beautiful man uh, named Moshe who had ALS, and when we told him why we were hiking the trail and what we were trying to do with our charity campaign, he looked at us point blank and he said, "The cure for ALS already exists." And he said it so simply, and he said. And I know this because God provides us with all of the cures for what's out there. We humans just haven't discovered it yet, but it exists. And he was 100% clear on that, with no doubt whatsoever. So um, one, I would love it. I, I, I didn't mention to people, first of all, I think, there, I think Tova put up a link to the book. The book is um, available on Amazon. And the ebook is, is actually still on sale, I believe, if you... If after the our meeting tonight, after our talk tonight, you can go over to Amazon and still pick it up at a little bit of a discount. It's on an Amazon countdown sale. Uh, there's also a paperback available, which is not on sale, but um, you can order that as well if you prefer not to read something online. Because the lessons that I gleaned, I wrote the book for myself first and foremost, and then I thought about the next generation, my grandchildren. I wanted them to be able to, to know what their grandparents went through and to glean some of the gifts that we discovered along the way. But then I realized, because I was doing the, the very last edit of this book during COVID, I realized that the lessons that I got while hiking the trail are more relevant than ever right now during the pandemic. And and so I had to get the book out and I had to get it. I, I had to get it out and thank God I, I got it out in the fall of this last year. And I would love, to, I would love to hear from the people in the audience. You know, if you have questions, even though we haven't been able to see questions from the audience, they, I'm assuming they can still go back and they can post them later. Right. Yes, I can. Yeah, exactly. I will yeah. and I will check, folks, I will go in and I will check and I will look at the questions. That oh, you fantastic. Oh. Now look, just before we close, uh, could you tell our audience what happened, how you were able to use that money oh, for, for, for research? Because that's another story again. Yeah, uh, that was actually very moving because um, the woman who was in charge of the Israeli ALS organization, they, they have a dual purpose. They both try to help fund research and they also very much um, are there to try to support both the people with the LS and their families. And so after the hike, she said, listen, we, we actually have another idea of how this money can be used. She thought initially it would be used for a particular research study. And she said, but the scientists are telling us that one of the things that becomes so complicated is collecting blood samples from these patients. These patients suffer enough. And then each time a scientist does a study, they have to go and stick these patients and get blood from them. So she said, with your permission, we would like to start um, let's call it like a pool of blood samples where they only yeah, a bank, a bit, kind of like a bank where they're yeah. taking blood samples. They only have to do that, I believe, once. And the samples then are there for different researchers to use. And that's what they ended up doing. And what was even more special is because then there was this collection of blood samples that different researchers had access to they started collaborating with one another. 
And we met them about a year after we finished the trail and they were thanking us. Uh, and I was in tears. Here are these brilliant minds that are working on a cure for ALS and they were saying how grateful they were to us. And I was just thinking, I'm so grateful for you, to you for, for trying to work yeah. and do the impossible, find, find a cure for this disease as soon as possible. So I thank yes. you. But I thought the collaboration that you created out of it all was was so well worth it. You know, if it was that, if that's all you did, and you know that collaboration between researchers, I presume from different universities or whatever, Absolutely. that they cooperated with one another. But also having that bank of blood samples gives a wider range because when it comes to um, uh, um, research, you need to be able to prove that this is the pathway or whatever that I took to um, to reach this conclusion. And the more samples you've got, the better is your, um, uh, what would you call it, your um, your case. Yeah. And yeah. you're just succeeding, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sippy, thank you so much. It's just been so beautiful. And anyone who wants to query anything, Sippy will have a look on, and of course, it's morning here for me in Australia, although it's not daylight yet. Oh, it's um, not? No, it's quarter past six or ten past six in the morning. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's just been lovely meeting you. It's and, been uh, lovely Any questions? And if, and if Tova could just put a link to my email, it's alchemists with an S at the end, at gmail.com. I would love to hear from people in the audience. Um, if you have any questions that you want to ask me directly that way, you're welcome to contact me, whether it's just questions in general or questions about uh, the different kinds of coaching and therapy that I do with people. Thank you, Tova, for putting that up. Good. She's put up, she's put up your email address and the inner alchemist, and she's also put up the, um, the I think she's put up the link to the book as well. So it's, thank you so much. It's just been beautiful. And it's lovely meeting you. It's lovely meeting you too. And I just want to thank Tova for the beautiful quote that she's sharing here. To believe in miracles, you have to be a realist, said Ben Gurion. And she's so right. Ben Gurion, that visionary who lived in the desert himself for so many years. That's where he retired. So thank you. And thank you to the audience, whoever joined us here tonight, despite the technical difficulties that, that there were in the beginning. It was a pleasure to be here together with you all. Thank you. Good night. Good morning. Bye-bye.